Welcome back to Green is Good, and we're so excited and honored to have Brian Clark Howard on. He's an award-winning journalist, author, editor, producer. Welcome to Green is Good, Brian. Thanks, John. You know, Brian, you've done so many cool things. Your bio, is, I would take me the whole 15 minutes to, to get into everything you've been doing your whole life that, that affects the world for the better. Can you share your journey, though, and your history uh, with our listeners before we get into any Q&A today? Sure, John. Thanks. So I grew up in the Midwest, and my parents were huge outdoor people. They always took me camping. Uh, I started out doing a lot of hiking in, a, in the papoose when I was really little. I so always had a great affection love for the outdoors. I was an Eagle Scout. And I went to college thinking I wanted to study ecology. I actually did research on birds. And it was great. I learned a lot. I love being outdoors. But I realized over time that what I really enjoyed most was the communication aspect, was commuting sort of my love for nature and science to others. And so I got really into uh, reading about science, writing about science. And I started to work for E, the environmental magazine, as an intern, just right off college. Uh, it worked out great. I worked up to an editor there. And uh, then I worked for a green living-focused website called The Daily Green. And I've been at National Geographic now a year and a half working on that website. Cool. And so um, talk a little bit about what you're doing at National Geographic. Like what's happening over there and what's the hot topics? So a lot of great stuff. It's uh, National Geographic is uh, celebrating its 125th anniversary wow. this year, actually, wow. and it's a great time of convergence for uh, you know a lot of folks know us from the magazine, which is still going strong. Um, the uh, National Geographic Channel is uh, actually there's two channels now. There's one called Wild, which focuses on animals, right. nature, and then there's the National Geographic Channel, right. which is kind of the flagship, and uh, the more books are being produced than ever. Um, there's Traveler magazine. And a lot of action on the web, which is where I spend most of my time. But it's a great time of convergence. We're, we've uh, very active in social media. We're one of the top brands on Instagram, hmm. where we uh, people share photos. We have amazing photographers around the world who put uh, incredible photos. Uh, that's sort of through the National Geographic eye, the National Geographic way of looking at the world. Hey, you know, we just passed Earth Day. Is Earth Day just become sort of a whole hum day, or is it still relevant to what we're trying to do with regards to the sustainability revolution? Well, I very much think it's still relevant. Okay. Um, I know every year we have, there's a big debate in media, and especially among yeah. people who identify as environmentalists, of do we still need Earth Day? You know, some websites like to say every day is Earth Day, and, you know, a lot of companies like to say that. Um, I, you know, I think that's great. It's great that it's become more mainstream in a lot of ways, and it's something that people do think about through the rest of the year. That's critical. But I think it's really important, too. Uh, it's a really good time to reflect both on where we've come as a movement, as uh, as culture, and uh, to kind of celebrate the gains that we've had. You know, a lot of times, it's especially activists get so concerned about what's the next fight around the corner, which right. is it's great to have that motivation, but it's also really important to take a pause and remember what's been done, and also just to get outside. I always encourage people, make sure you do at least one enjoyable outdoor thing on Earth Day. That's, you know, that's a great message. And for those that just joined us, we're so excited. that we got Brian Clark Howard on with us right now. You can check out his great work. I'm on his website right now. It's a very cool website. And, Brian, you've, you've put a lot of great stuff up there on brianclarkhoward.com. And also uh, go to nationalgeographic.com if you want to get inspired about what's going on in the great outdoors and the world around us. You know, Brian, you know, you've traveled the world. I've traveled the world. Europe's got got sustainability part of their dna uh parts of asia japan has uh sustainability and uh good environmental practices part of their dna has green become mainstream here in the u.s yet um well i think it depends who you ask i I think in a lot of ways it has um certainly when i started in um uh, around the year 2000 as a professional environmental journalist there really was a lot less awareness than there is now uh, it's really exciting now that everyone knows what organic food is, and everyone has a pretty good idea of what that means. And most people that at least I talk to uh, have a sense that it's better for better for the environment, probably better for them. You know, there's been different studies, but people have a strong awareness about that. Got it. When I started, uh, nobody knew what organic was. Right. You know, so in a lot of ways, uh, in certain areas, it's been really strong. Everyone knows what a hybrid car is now. Right. For years, you know, people had no idea. You know, everyone thought they still needed to be plugged in. And now, of course, you have plug-in hybrids. Like more and more people understand that, and they understand that their choices have impacts. Uh, you know, a lot of people say we have a long ways to go in terms of the energy, in terms of a lot of the ways that we live our lives. But I think in some of the core areas, like awareness, 
uh, I think people are way more mindful. And in that sense, I think it very much is mainstream now. Got it. And does it cut across, you know, does this whole green revolution cut across political and cultural lines also? Oh, a- absolutely, John. Yeah. The, um, you know, it's a little bit of a rubber band back and forth yeah. where, uh, you know, sometimes it can get politicized. Some, you know, certain politicians or groups can kind of seem like they're co-opting yeah. the green message right. for, for different. <laughs> I, I think that's part of the way culture evolves, though. It's always going to be a little bit of a back and forth, a, a readjusting. Right. I think the overall trend line very much is cutting across all boundaries, um, class, race, politics. I think that awareness certainly has permeated everyone everywhere, even in uh, the poorest developing countries to the boardroom. People now, they can't hide from the environment. You know, they, they, for the most part, you can't act, um, actively damage it and get away with it. You know, there, there's, there has to be a lot more uh, awareness, sensitivity to it than ever. And uh, so I think it really is coming across. Is it, is it more expensive, though? Is buying an organic apple more expensive than a regular apple? Or is the cost-benefit analysis just too important and overwhelming for us to be eating right, living right, using cleaners that don't have untested products in them? Does going green really have to cost more than not being green, Brian? Well, luckily, for the most part, it does not. Uh, certainly, there's a, a lot of instances where it can cost a bit more upfront. Right. But I like how you mentioned that there is a, a ROI, a return on investment. Right. That's a, a much bigger picture. You know, by eating healthier, you're much less likely to need healthcare down the road. But the good thing, the thing that's most exciting is that because green is maturing a lot, there's so many yeah. options now for truly affordable choices. So uh, there's a lot of things that are really great, like the Dirty Dozen list, which is like. <laughs> The most, uh, the twelve dirtiest uh, produce, right. and uh, if you buy organic for those, you're going to go. Uh, you get much more bang for your buck in terms of um, spending a little bit more, but avoiding the worst actors. And there's a lot of things that it doesn't matter as much. You know, like bananas, for example, where you're you're not eating the peel. The right. most of the, the pesticides are going to stay on the peel. Right. So that's an example where um, if you're really on a budget. It's, uh, it might make sense. Is more choice good, though? Or is, like, is, this, is, is the revolution on and more and more choices coming up for all of the consumers, both in what we eat, what we use to clean with, what water we drink, all this other kind of stuff? Is this, is this uh, plethora now of choices with regards to sustainable and green products good for us? Um, I, I think so. I think choice is always good. Um, but, you know, there is always the downside. There is that uh, psychology study uh, came out a few years ago, and it said if you give people too many choices, they get overwhelmed and they won't make any choice. Right. Um, there is some element of that, and it's definitely true that some of the green stuff can seem complicated. There's a lot of competing certification programs. Um, that's I always go back to organic, the USDA organic standard, because it's so strong because it's so simple. It's just um, you know it's no pesticides, uh, no genetically modified organisms. It's very simple. Right. Uh, the problem with some certification style programs is that the rules can get complicated and the rules can shift because everything has changed. Uh, that's good because it allows flexibility, but it can be a little overwhelming for consumers. You know, you know, Brian, we're down to the last two minutes or so. What, what final pearls of wisdom can you leave with our listeners around the world uh, with regards to what, I don't, first of all, how to, be, how to live more green and how to live more sustainability? And, and, and also there's a lot of young people that want to be the next Brian Clark Howard, any pearls of wisdom on, on, on how to follow that path? Well, I think uh, kind of hitting both areas, the, the thing to do is to do what makes most sense for you. Right. Uh, there's usually somebody comes to green from a particular interest, whether it's a woman who has just had a child and wants to sort of detoxify her house, someone who's really a, naturally a foodie, so they're attracted to the food side of things. If you're kind of like a gearhead, you might be attracted to the transportation things more. Right. Uh, similarly, career-wise, uh, you know, whatever your passion is, you can kind of combine that with green, and um, it's a natural entree point both to building a career and also to building a happy green life. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. And for our listeners out there, I want you to go to Brian's great website, uh, brianclarkhoward.com, but also go, you know, Brian's the editor and producer. He's a humble guy. He's an editor and producer for National Geographic's award-winning website. And go check out his great work at nationalgeographic.com. You know, Brian, you're always welcome back on Green is Good. We want you to come back on. You're doing so many great things, and, you, and your voice needs to be heard, and the great work that you're doing needs to be seen. So we want our listeners to go out there and 
enjoy. Again, nationalgeographic.com. Your sustainability and green thought leader, Brian Clark Howard, and truly living proof that green is good. Thank you, John.